I like command with the sun coming in on this side and my my temperature is like 108. <laughs> I, I think the trend right now is there there's tends to be more of them getting interested only for a career to be a commercial pilot. Sure. You know, I look at kind of the three pillars of being a business leader. And the first one is you have to have a strategy. Mics here, really snuggle up in there. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what's new with you, huh? Already planning for AirVenture next year. Yeah. But in the meantime, we got a, a museum project that's getting ready to open early next year, which is our key focus right now. It was a big investment. Yeah, we're gonna have, we're gonna have to dig into that because I got. I got questions. You saw them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, grab your pizza and let's grab a seat. We're gonna we're gonna roll into this podcast here today. What's great about a podcast too is if you don't fill up all the seats, you always got posts to make up for it. So um, very huge round of applause for the Chamber of Commerce, the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce for helping us put this together. Um, they have been absolutely wonderful. The Oshkosh Chamber is helping us sponsor this event today. Um, we also, uh, the Venture Project is a co-sponsor as well. Um, so we have the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce and the Venture Project, which is right here, a co-working space and incubator where we bring startups and small businesses together to collaborate and create new ideas and, and bring them to the table. Well, our guest of honor today is uh, someone that, that around here really needs no introduction at all. We have uh, Jack Pelton, the CEO and chairman of EAA. Uh, we also He's also the former CEO of Cessna and has a long, extensive business experience and track record in the world of aviation and aeronautics. So I think uh, this will be really exciting for us today to dig into us. We're going to ask some questions, or I'm going to ask some questions for the next you know, 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll open the door for you guys to allow you know, a couple of extra questions. So if you have some questions at the end, save those for the end, and we'll make sure uh, we get Jack to, to give us a good answer. So without any further ado, Jack Pelton, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aaron. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Well, so, you know, we always hear your name. We never really get a chance to, to see you, the, the man behind the scenes at EAA. We hear about EAA. Everybody rents their house out and all this stuff. And it's good to finally see the man behind the scenes here that's, that's really running the show. So um, my first question is, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself, kind of where you came from and, and where you grew up and a little bit about your story? Yeah, I'm a Southern Californian. I was born and raised there through my first 40 years of life. Um, Grew up on the beach, enjoyed surfing, uh, outdoors, and, and aviation. And it hit me at a really early age with my dad being an EA member. And that's wow. what got me into aviation was going to EA meetings at Flaybob, California. Sure. So you, were, you had aviation interests all the way since you were a kid. I did. I did. And it was one of those, um, you know, family of four, only kid that had that interest. Uh, my dad served in the, in the Air Force and, and was a pilot for four years and had he was a recreational pilot, GA pilot through his professional career. Um, so it was always around the house, but, um, it, it got in under my skin early on and, uh, <laughs> I have done nothing but that my entire life. I've never had a job other than in high school and other places at any place other than an aviation company. Wow. Um, so and I know you've, you know, you've been in the world of business for a while. Have you ever done anything, you know, in your younger years when you're entrepreneurial or do you think there's, there's value in having entrepreneurial experiences in business at all? Um, I know we're going to talk a lot about your corporate experience, but I'd be curious just to hear about that. You know, as a kid, I, I certainly did, but it was probably no different than a lot of other people. I, I remember in high school, I learned to paint my first car when I was 15. I, I built it and, or I had bought it restored it from the ground up and the final phase was painting it. So I bought a compressor, learned how to paint. Actually turned out pretty good. And all of a sudden I had the summer of cars lined up that wanted to be painted. And I thought, okay, this is a pretty good side hustle. <laughs> then we got in a friend of mine. He had kind of a storage access to a storage facility. And we started flipping cars when we were 15 and 16 years old. <laughs> uh, you know, find a good deal, fix it up, throw a paint job on it and dump it. Right, and right. It was kind of, that was kind of interesting. But really when you look at the entrepreneurial piece, um, I think all great companies that are successful have an entrepreneurial niche to them sure. relative to innovation. I know, I know certainly that was what was, I think, really key to driving Cessna in the, in the formative years, but also while I was there. Tell me a little bit about that, because I think that's, um, you know, 
in, in at least in the startup atmosphere that we're used to being in, it seems like there's this dichotomy. There's there's corporate and there's entrepreneurial, and and to me it's it's more business instinct. I think there's there's certain things to look for. In your opinion, what does that mean? You know, what is it? What are you looking at to as a as a business person? What are you looking at to become entrepreneurial? How are you assessing decisions? How does that all come together in your opinion? It, it's it's um, you know I look at kind of the three pillars of being a business leader, and the first one is you have to have a strategy. And the entrepreneurial piece really comes into developing that strategy. And I think you should be spending a third of your time developing and understanding what your strategy is. And if you look at companies that, that are producing things, innovation has to be at the top of that. And the only way you can really crack the code and not become um, a big company that gets in its own way is you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit in your innovation area. So whether it be advanced design or development or skunk works or all of the various things right. that have done that, you've got to break that out of the bureaucracy and make sure that it, it really is thriving, innovating, creating ideas. You know, if one in 10 plays out, that's fine. If it was a one in a hundred, it plays out, but you've got to have those kinds of things going on or you'll never get out of your own way. The, the other two thirds is on execution on your strategy. And the last piece is of developing people. And very rarely do you get people that spend a third of their time truly developing people, creating succession planning, uh, creating an environment for people to thrive in. Wow. You know, something that, that comes up a lot in discussion in business is I think a, a similar topic that comes up you see sometimes in politics. You have um, a progression. You have the progressive side, but you also have tradition. And I think that comes into play in business as well. You have innovation, you know, trying to, to create the better mousetrap, but then there's also the reinventing the wheel, something that's already worked. Where do you see um, the balance of that as a business leader? How, how much, you know, if you could give a ratio or if you could give a thought process of how you can look at innovation versus tradition or versus things that are working, how do you evaluate that? I, I look at tradition as when the innovative ideas become a product, then it gets put into tradition. Sure. And the tradition is to execute on getting it delivered. The, the, the tradition is around supporting it, the business aspects of it, the, the life cycle cost of it, the customer service piece. But the front end has got to be wildly innovative or you're never, ever going to, to really grow a company. Yeah. And we had, you know, examples at Cessna that we, uh, um, all the time we had stuff in our skunk works that nobody knew about. People don't even know about it today because we didn't talk about it. Um, when he entered the light sport market, we jumped in an airplane and flew to, uh, I guess it was Deland Air Show, and, or Sebring, Sebring, because they were starting this light sport. And I, so I got some of my guys together and said, do you think we should get into this market? I don't know. Let's go see. And so we joked about we we're all going to put on glasses and, and mustaches and go there, and nobody will know who we are. <laughs> I wore glasses at the time and already had the mustache, so it, did, it, didn't really, it wasn't really much of a ruse. And we showed up on a Citation 10, which wasn't much of a ruse either when you <laughs> land, that, land that baby and, and pile out of it. But, you know, we did a lot of, of lot of just grassroots saying, what if, what if, what if? And then we locked them up in a room and said, you got 12 months to deliver one. And and they did. And it turned out to be a great, we launched it here at Air Venture and took a thousand orders the first day. Wow. Um, but it's those kinds of things that you have to do. Then, then, you know, then you hand it off to the certification group and the production group to to execute on it. Sure. But if you don't do that, you're going to miss out on markets. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned another third of your business was people, was developing mm -hmm. people. And I think certain people have more um, entrepreneurial tendencies, but then you also need the workers, right? You need the people that are willing to execute. How do you look at that as well? How do you, what, how do you advise people to train others and, and to coach them and to put them in the right places? <laughs> it's quite, it's quite a process. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's spending time with them to understand where they where they really best fit and can be. You got to look at them as where can they provide value for you as a company and get them into the right area for providing value. But you know, you look at the the, the entrepreneur piece of that is look at what has changed since COVID as far as what expectations are from employees. We spend every day at over at over at EA trying to figure out what what should we look like and be going forward. Yeah, because it's a whole different expectation and environment. So you got to be entrepreneurial to kind of change what used to be the norms because if you don't nobody's you're not gonna be an attractive place to work yeah, it's like adaptive it's it's about moving with the times and mm -hmm. responding to these different environments how do you how did you do that with eaa how did you make them adaptive how did you respond because you know eaa this was one of the biggest you know news stories in history was was eaa shut down you know all people around the world during the covid times um how did you survive that how did you what was your thought process for for building up to that there was no buildup. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it came with, 
you know, the shutdown where everybody has to go home here in town. So we, we immediately got our IT folks set so we could send people home to work from home. And that was that was day one. And then working every day together as a team, whether it be by Zoom or by, whether it be by phone, to try to figure out what is what is this environment that we're in and where is this going um, and trying to walk through the steps of that, which is really tough. Um, if you go back in EA, when I came to EA, um, the cultural issue there was the place had tanked. And, and I was asked to come in as a volunteer because I was re- had been retired about a year um, to try to build it back up and try to get confidence in our employees and in our, in our members. So we, we had been through that, which kind of helped us when we got to COVID because I think by then people had a belief in leadership that we were going to make the right decisions and we were trying to preserve their jobs, which we did a pretty darn good job of. The unknown was if you get to another, another year of no air venture financially, can you sustain it? Yeah. And I go back to strategy. So one of the strategies we put in place six, well, actually seven years ago, was I had looked at the business and it was so dependent on AirVenture financially being dependent. I said, this isn't going to play. This, this is not sustainable. So if you ever have tornado, windstorm, disaster, terrorism, you name it, and AirVenture can't be had, we go out of business. So we had worked a plan that allowed us to be able to create reserves and year over year, build those reserves up enough to where you could get through a year without air venture and still be financially uh, sustainable. Wow! So that's but not two years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that our, our worry was: you're sitting here leading up to July and going, "Okay, we've been without one." And when we started January of 2021, it was still iffy and dicey as to whether there would be an air venture in 2021. So, so it's almost like the diversification or your strategy to kind of like move money into reserves. Re- saved you during the COVID time because you had planned for the worst case scenario. We did. We, we had in our strategy a continued, you know, what is it going to be to be able to sustain this organization long term financially? You know, there's all the various elements you got to look at. But from a financial standpoint, that was really important to me. Yeah. It, it reminds me of something when, when we were in the military. Um, I remember uh, talking to you a little bit about this earlier. But when we were planning for a mission, there were two things we'd look at. We'd look at the most likely scenario, and then we look at the most dangerous scenario, and that's what you'd plan for for your enemy. So, you know, most of the time, the most dangerous doesn't happen, but if it does, you have to have a, a contingency plan for it. Likely is usually what happens, and that's what you're planning for. And I think you can apply that to business, and in a lot of ways, that's what you did, is, is you looked at what's the most dangerous possible thing, and do we have a plan for that? Yeah, and we even look that that risk continuum we look at for everything we do. So you look at when we finally got around to planning that there was going to be an air venture, we had to plan the risk assessment of what was it going to be. Half the attendance, 70% of the attendance, full attendance, um, and then plan the event around it financially to make sure that you were flexible enough that if the scenario of most likely came true, that it would it would be successful financially. If the scenario of it's wildly successful. That's just gravy. And then also, how do you throttle it back if it's going to be something less than? Sure. So I want to talk a little bit about, too, um, you know, kind of in your story, right? So you're at Cessna. Uh, what are some things that, you know, as you were kind of growing and developing and, and climbing through a company that you saw were things that worked for you well and, and things that contributed to your success growing to become the CEO um, of Cessna? I. It, it was I was kind of baptism by fire. So I, I joined Cessna as the head of engineering and flight test. And two years into it, or almost less than two years, the president quit. And so they, they started the search to go see what, you know, who was going to take over Cessna. And I was uh, holding the fort down, if you will, as, as an internal candidate. And then I put together the strategy that I took to the board that says, here's what we got to do to go forward. And it was around innovation and customer service because – with the installed base of customers we had, that's a big, big uh, revenue stream that comes through there. And I didn't think we were very good at how we take care of our customers. Um, they made me CEO. Um, I took the company from nine hundred million to six billion wow. in, in five years, <laughs> and the employment grew from four thousand people to sixteen thousand people. And then we also created a, f- a worldwide footprint of customer service. And c- the customer piece was kind of interesting because. I attributed it to my wife, of which she's never cashed in on. But we, we were <laughs> on a business trip. We head out. The airplane's got a problem. We turn around and come back. And we go to our service center in Wichita. We get out. They're going to go take a look at the airplane. And, and uh, she says, this is, this is embarrassing. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, this thing's a dump. She said, y- you sell a $20 million business jet. You have the offices that you sell them. And you, you, take, you have catered 
chef on staff when the, when the process of selling it to them is done and they're getting their leather jacket, they're getting treated nice, they get their airplane and their ownership experience is awful. She said, when I take my car into the to the dealer, I get cappuccino, I get a nice waiting area, I get a ride home, the facility's beautiful and clean. She said, your bathrooms are awful, the whole thing. <laughs> and so we just blew the thing up and we created what we, we had an acronym for it, but taking care of customers is taking care of business. And my philosophy on that was, through the ups and downs of aviation, which we always have, there's four and five year cycles, that your customers will hang with you if you have taken great care of them mm. during the whole ups and downs. We built an entire new service center structure throughout the entire U.S. and overseas um, with creating that experience being better than actually the sales process. So I think, you know, one thing that, that you strike me as is a great, you know, strategy man, right? You, you, you understand strategy, you understand how to build a business and grow a business. What is like your process or your, your thought process when you're going into a strategic concept, when you're, when you're looking at the next five, seven, 10, 15, you know, kind of that, you put the CEO hat on. I, I, I laugh at it because people that work for me would say the opposite, that I'm the, the person on the shop floor in Cessna, I knew all of them and I knew what the hell was going on. And, and my that drives a senior vice president crazy when you come in in the morning and say, I understand you got part shortages and there's a delay in your area. And they're like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. Because you got to get out and be around and, and know what's going on. The strategy piece is really just looking at the, the, the markets that you're in, looking at the competitive landscape, looking at is there some kind of breakthrough technology that may give you an advantage? Is there just what are all those pieces? And you've got to, we would meet every two weeks on that. And I would actually chair the meetings. I wouldn't, wasn't waiting for ideas to come to me. And it creates a really engaging environment where people are stoked about wanting to be a part of that. And we look at all pieces of the business on, from a strategy standpoint. So you think it comes... And, we, and we've adopted that exact same thing at EA. Yeah. So, so it comes with kind of researching existing technology, emerging markets and mm -hmm. things like that, that you're spending a lot of time looking into. Are you... Uh, I guess not to get too in the weeds, but like, you know, how are you finding these? Are you pushing people to, you know, research and, and innovate? I, I, I do. Yeah. I did at Cessna. That's certainly, they, they were expected to be able to come to the table with strong understandings on, you know, what's going on in every region of the, of the world. Because um, the, the funnel then starts getting small because you only got so much capital to allocate. Right. And it gets to be all about capital allocation. So then you're looking at where am I going to make the bet? You know, is the South American market, if it's only 30% of the, of the world consumption of business, just probably want to make sure I don't over, over bet on what they need in that region. Um, so, you know, the funnel goes and you go through the process and then all of a sudden it's like an aha, aha moment. It becomes really clear what you got to go do. Yeah. You know, I, th I always think that's fascinating, you know, the, the, the different processes or methods that people use to kind of build a business and look forward to the future. And, you know, I know you're kind of unique in the fact that you're known as, you know, a businessman, but you're also known as a pilot. And I think a lot of people who are going to be tuning into this, you know, and checking out the podcast and stuff probably are interested in, in just your experience or understanding of, of being in the air and, and being an aviator. Where did, so you, you mentioned as a kid, the aviation bug kind of bit you early as your father was in the air force. Mm -hmm. um, where did that kind of go from there? Like where did it go when as a young adult and how did the, the aviator side of you start to grow? It, it, Growing up, I just knew I wanted to learn to fly. I mean, it was just something you, you go to air shows, you hang out at the airport, you knew that that's something you wanted to pursue. And, you know, it was a discussion with my dad at age 17 saying, it's, it's time, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go learn to fly. And, you know, he said, great, how are you going to pay for it? I mean, <laughs> that was back in the good old days when that's how you're raised. You, you work for what you, what you get. And he said, uh, well, you got that compressor that you've been painting cars with. He says, I'll buy it from you, but this is what we're telling your mom. <laughs> that this is how you're paying for it because I'm going to buy the compressor back of which you're still going to get to use, but you're going to have the cash from that to go ahead and start, start flying lessons. And then it just went from there. And I, oh boy, once I got in the air, I, I was beyond hooked. Wow. What are and some then continue to progress through various airplanes and ratings and, yeah, so, I mean, knowing nothing about aviation, me, you know, what is that, you know, where did it kind of start? Like, do you start with small planes? Like, what, what is, what's what's kind of been your... Start where everyone starts, a Cessna 150 or 172 <laughs> at the flight school and uh, uh, start learning from that point on. And then once you get your ratings and you move up and you get an instrument rating and then a commercial rating and then a, eventually I moved into higher performance airplanes and jets and got an airline transport rating. What's like some of the, some of the coolest stories you've had as just a, <laughs> a pilot, you know? Oh, God, they're endless. I, I mean, part of the, before I became CEO at Cessna, I already had my Citation type range, which allowed me to fly Citation jets who were built by, by Cessna. And to be able to visit customers anywhere in the world and you show up getting out of the left seat of the cockpit certainly puts you on a different, 
understanding with the customer that you're, you're selling product to, which helped. Um, I thought you were going to ask me this one. I was thinking about the other day, especially because of the COVID. Leave Wichita and I'm heading over to, um, I was going at that time to Dubai, but we decided to go west and we went and first fuel stop was in, in Petro in, in Russia, an old military base there full of Sequoias and MiGs. And they come into the cockpit, it was during SARS, and they have one of the thermometer guns that they're putting on your face to see if you have a temperature. And if your temperature's up, you're not leaving Russia. They're going to quarantine you at this old, <laughs> <laughs> terrible military base. And I'm pilot in command with the sun coming in on the side, and my, my temperature is like 108 <laughs> from, the, from the skin. And all my guys are like, we'll miss the old man, but we're, <laughs> we're taking the plane and leaving and I'm getting alcohol wipes trying to get my temperature down to get out of there. And, and so I thought, well, okay, this is going to be our, our one big adventure on the trip. We head South and we got to go across India and they got a They got a no fly. We couldn't get a flight permit to go over the country. Now we're flying all the way down around India over Maldives to get back up to Iraq. And I ran into, into Dubai and it was like the trip from hell, but, <laughs> but very interesting. Um, but, you know, that's, that's business travel. My most, most enjoyable flying is 1,000 feet above the ground across this country. Um, in 2011, I bought a Stearman in Boston, which is a 1942 twin, uh, biplane open cockpit, and flew it from Boston to Wichita, which is exactly halfway across the country at no higher than 1,000 feet on a 4th of July day. It took me two days. And that is probably the most romantic thing you can ever do i mean you can smell the barbecues on the ground you can see the cattle you can go over the trees it the winds in your face it's like being on a harley it's just fantastic have you seen um you know just as as we're always evaluating different generations and their interests like younger people getting more or less interested in flying as as kind of the future goes or what have you noticed i i think the trend right now is there there's tends to be more of them getting interested only for a career to be a commercial pilot. Sure. And we have a lot of work to do to get young people's attention <clears throat> because you can do everything now in three minutes or less. And I mean, it's, it's on your iPad, it's in front of you, it's gaming, it's wherever it may be, um, sports. So we have a lot of work to do to try to get, and that's one of big part of EA's mission. And our Young Eagles program, which is a, has been a great first step, um, over two and a half million kids we've given rides to for, so they can experience flight. But the question had been is what's next? So you go on this flight, that was cool. I can go on another one if I want some other date, but there's nothing that keeps them engaged in aviation. So we have just uh, created and launched what we call Aero Educate, and it's a program that takes, after you've finished the flight experience, it's, it's an online curriculum that then they can pursue path, what we call pathways into various careers in aviation and interests in aviation, from general aviation to commercial pilots to mechanics to marketing to um, all aspects. And it's kind of a a, a growth where you a badging program where you can you can accumulate pr- uh, progress and and then have rewards at the end of it and it's really geared for eight to eighteen year olds. Um, we've just launched that with the support of United and a lot of other people that are helping us with that. And we think that's now going to be the ongoing engagement because it's also going to have modules in there. So where's the closest air show to where I live? Where's the closest EA chapter? Where can I go get flight experience? That kind of stuff. Um, we're very excited about that. Yeah. Because if you don't get them hooked before high school, you aren't going to get them. Really? The schools, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of great schools that do have aviation curriculums in it, um, but getting curriculum in the schools is so hard because of standardized testing and all the requirements to get through high school and into college. Is, as far as like the kind of the, the holistic market looks, is there a huge growth in demand for aviators or is it more of um, consistent with what you've seen? Huge demand in the commercial market. I okay. mean, they're Boeing and, and the airlines are saying 20,000 new pilots are going to be needed in the next 10 years. And, and that's a significant number when you think how long it takes to get through that. Where, um, cause you know, it's just kind of thinking, we're always thinking of opportunities, uh, emerging markets, you know, for entrepreneurs, where are some emerging technologies that you think are going to complement the, aer- the aerospace industry or kind of replace, or, you know, what are you kind of like looking at as kind of, you know, from the strategic level? You, you can't ignore the UAS, whichever acronym you want to use for right. uh, unmanned the drones, man, yeah. drones uh, ur- urban air mobility it, the problem that we have now with the growth in the world on the supply chain side, so you look at an Amazon or a UPS or anybody on getting packages delivered, that's probably a solution that probably will work. I don't think it's going to be a great people transport solution. I don't think the economics work. 
But, you know, running into the UPS man down at the mailbox, I said, hey, how's it going? What's, this, what's the holiday season like? He says, we need 300 drivers in the Fox Valley for the holiday season immediately. And he said, of those 300, 150 are going to be driving their own cars because we got no vehicles or method for them to take packages around. <laughs> so, I mean, any, of, any, any young entrepreneur that can work on real-world problems and come up with technology solutions – Boy, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly bet my money on them. So you don't think that, um, like I've, I saw a video a couple of weeks ago, it was a electric drone at 20 minutes of flight time, and it was piloted by a person, and it had a cage around them. Um, you don't think that is going to somehow creep into the aerospace industry, or you don't think that's going to be sustainable long term? The technology has to improve. 20 minutes isn't going to buy you anything. Right. And, and that's there's a lot of hurdles, and I think <clears throat> they've got to start thinking um, – hybrid types of propulsion systems, not just electrical. We were Just before I left to come over here, I was talking about to one of my guys about, yeah, I was looking at there was a new, um, one of the football games, there's some new electric car that was out there. And I keep thinking, hmm, that would be interesting. But for, my, for where I live, what I do and all that, it's totally impractical. I mean, if I want to go see my kids in Kansas City, I'm going to have to charge somewhere along the way, so that doesn't work. Right. Um, they did a study in my neighborhood that if we all had cars and came home at 5 o'clock and plugged them in, we'd take the grid down. <laughs> I mean, and that's just 35 homes. So you look at all of that and you say, this has got to evolve to a place that you solve those kinds of problems to make it practical and work. Um, Uber already gave up on, on transporting people. They, they were real big into the U.S. US activity early on, had many of meetings with them here in Oshkosh. And you ask them, you know, what's the mission? Well, I'm going to take somebody from 20 minutes away from the airport and get them right to the airport. airport. And then being on the airplane side kind of guy, I said, okay, four guys, luggage. Have you gone through the weight analysis of what kind of lifting body that takes for that? Uh, we'll, put their, we'll put their luggage in a car and drive it. <laughs> and I said, okay, now you've doubled the cost. So <laughs> how, how's this all going to work? Right. Um, but there are areas and places that they work really well. Um, aerial surveillance, replacing helicopters. I mean, there's lots of stuff that can be done with manned or unmanned newer hybrid types of platforms. I'm, I, I'm just saying it's still going to take a lot of time before we get to. Sure. So you think that the main purpose of the UAS is are going to be the kind of those micro applications, surveillance, uh, transporting small packages, you know, things that are not weight intensive. In, inspecting cell towers. I sure. Mean, anybody who has a commercial... Uh, entity that has building, the, the biggest costs and concerns you have is your employees getting hurt. So, you, you know, you're always worried about safety and you throw somebody, you know, up four stories high to inspect buildings on an annual basis, you got a risk and you got insurance associated with that. You can take a UAS with a camera and do that job in 15 minutes. Um, windmill blades. Yeah. I mean, who'd want that job? But Window gotta, washing. I saw somebody it. over here at this bank way up on that. I'm like, that doesn't look like I would want to do that, but and, and that's you know that's a great application of technology to eliminate the the, the cost of people, the the risk of people, and the insurance that goes with it. And right. you redeploy those people doing something more value added. So that's UAS. What other um, applications are you like uh, in, that are are you starting to see? Kind of there's been the a lot industry? in the safety side that's already been done. I mean, we, the advent of, of GPS, you know, made made flying not have to be. It could be literally point to point. You define the points versus pre-established points. Um, now we're getting into higher levels of automation where airplanes can land themselves. I mean, Garmin just won a, a wonderful award. Um, it's on the Cirrus jet and on the TBMs where you hit the button that everything's gone to hell or the pilots died, and it will take you to an airport and land you. And that kind of technology, I think it's going to get deployed into our smaller, lighter airplanes at lower costs over time, which is you know very exciting to think. That gets people interested who are afraid of flying or the spouse who doesn't say, well, what happens if she doesn't know how to fly or, or, the, or the partner, whatever, however you want to characterize it. Mm -hmm. um, those, those things that are going to definitely happen. Wow. Do you see any like um, improvements outside of safety, like into the, like, where do you start to see kind of where aerospace and, you know, kind of space travel meets or like, where is, what's the future of that look like as someone that's kind of embedded into the aerospace industry a little bit? The, the space travel one has always intrigued me because I scratch my head and say, it's, it's really a Disneyland ride. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're hitting, you're, you're going up and you're hitting the borders of space and, and saying, you know, I did it coming right back down. There's no mission yet. Yeah. And, and I think there needs to be a mission or a purpose to, to get it beyond where it's just an amusement ride. 
Yeah, I, w- I was pretty interested with uh, looking at um, Virgin Galactic's design, where they basically just used a, a aeros or an, a, a plane design that ended up reaching higher levels of space, and it was an interesting way of la- of launching and things like that that I think have changed the Blue Origin method, right? Which is your classic, you know, propulsion jet system. And I was just kind of curious of what your thoughts were on like those types of technologies as they kind of grow and where you think technology is going. You know, I think it's like all technology. They're developing technology for technology's sake. And then you got to find where does it... The purpose. Yeah, yeah. what's the purpose that's going to go on? There's going to be stuff that comes out of there like the NASA programs did years ago that become commercial, commercially viable for the public. Because if you don't have a market big enough, it doesn't, you know, you aren't going to be able to use it. Yeah. Um, so what they're doing is, is interesting, but again, I'm, it needs a purpose. What are like the newer kind of uh, plane designs and things that are coming out that, that an average person like me doesn't really know about, you know, but you probably are hearing about these or they're, they're kind of coming through EAA occasionally or things well, like that. You know, that. right now, most of it is around the propulsion systems. So you're, you're, they're trying to get a lot new jet engines, especially for the airliners that have, um, you know, less environmental impact. That's that's the big push is to have... You zero, see these zero, things with electric planes and things like that, you know, yeah. but I don't know how re- reasonable or feasible that is. Those are a long ways off. <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a battery power density issue, and we won't get into all, all the <laughs> stuff on that, uh, but it's at some point that may be practical. But yeah. right now, can you take an actual existing engine and find a way to make its environmental footprint l- less intrusive? That's really a hot button right now that needs a lot of work. Are there different programs? Um, You know, we've talked before about, you know, grants. Air Force, you know, has certain grants for different Mm -hmm. type of renewal technology. Uh, The government provides, you know, types of grants and things like this for people to do some of these skunk work R&D projects and funded. Um, Are you aware of stuff like that? Yeah, DARPA, is, which is a big government agency that hands out um, grants in all different sizes. You know, very small stuff for, for people who would be here at the venue to... Um, major defense contractors that are working on it. But they usually have a call for, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Are you willing to spend some time on it? Um, very worthwhile to pursue. Yeah. Do you, where do you, uh, you know, what are the kind of the next things that you're working on right now with, with EAA and kind of the future of EAA? You know, Oshkosh natives here, we know a lot about kind of the history and we like going and checking stuff out and seeing what's all going on. But What's kind of the next steps? Like, what are what's going to happen with EAA as, as you kind of grow it? You know, a lot of people, it, it, you always have to remind them, is that we're an association that does stuff year-round, and we have 250,000 members, and it's not just a one-week event. Um, so one of the first things we, we have really focused on the last five years, how do we use our assets that we have here in Oshkosh better? And when I say use them better, how do we make it a year-round facility with offerings that are year-round, whether it be youth camps, things at the museum to engage people, our facilities where we have a, we have a lodge on campus? How do we get those so that that asset is being used, used year-round? And we finally stepped back and looked at Air Venture and said there's two things that happen at Air Venture every year that are absolutely cornerstone, remarkably well attended. We get the highest marks. Or one's called Kid Venture. And it is an area where kids of all ages can go into various uh, like STEM learning labs and, and build, a, build a wing rib out of wood or carve a prop, prop or learn how brakes, hydraulics work. And there are these various stations. And so we said, okay, that we have the ingredients for that. We've got the curriculum for that. We, we've tested it over the last 15 years or 20 years. It works great. Put that one on, on the table. Then our pilot proficiency center, which we have, which is we have 13 simulators that we use during Air Venture for people to come in with a flight instructor and hone their skills on a, on a simulator without having to be in an airplane or at a risk f- for essentially no cost. Those simulators sit year-round. So we said, how do you take that and put that, activate that year-round? And that's exactly what our new addition on our museum is all about. It's, mm. it's 30,000 square feet with the top floor will be essentially a a higher skill set of kid venture. So we have learning labs in there that will be able to, to program for whatever we want to do in them year round with youth groups and kids and schools. Um, and then the first floor has a pilot proficiency center where we'll activate those 13 simulators plus some new ones year round and be able to bring in groups of people to train. Um, and then a conference center that's attached to it also that seats 300 people. Wow. So that's, that's the beautiful new addition to the uh, south side of the museum. Um, probably going to be one of the most spectacular buildings in Oshkosh when we cut the ribbon in April 
um, certainly built with a style and design that's going to last 30 years. Yeah. And I think that, so it's going to be more engaging year round. It's going to be ways to involve the community and other things like that. It's going to bring people into Oshkosh. We, yeah. We've already, since we hatched the idea and started the construction, um, we've, we've reached out to a lot of groups and in the pilot community, there's already people who have said, sign me up. I'm going to host an event and, and various groups of pilots for different aircraft model makes and types. So it's going to bring a lot of people to Oshkosh. What other like big opportunities do you see kind of out in the kind of the more of the distance for EAA or out there that you kind of got your eyes on or you're looking towards? We had uh, suspended because of COVID some of the stuff that we had just launched, which was our Sport Pilot Academy, where we bring in people and you can train to get a Sport Pilot's license in three weeks guaranteed at a firm fixed price. And so we've got the planes and the assets for that. So we are very excited about getting in the spring, getting that stood back up again. We, we usually ran four classes, five classes a year, uh, getting that going again. And then we want to expand our youth academy so that we bring kids in for a week at a time sure. uh, for aviation studies. Cool. Well, I got one last question before we're going to open up the floor here to uh, our audience members. Um, just what kind of general advice would you give for the different business leaders in here or aspiring entrepreneurs that are interested in kind of growing themselves in the business world? You know, it goes back to my opening comments. I, I, re I really think it's important that you spend a lot of time looking at strategy and, and strategy is not just a, a word. It's a very complex topic because then you're looking into the environment and, and not, not the clouds and the sun, but the, the business environment, the markets that you're in, um, the, the, the em employment environment, the, the compensation, right? All aspects of what makes you a successful company and how do you find an edge to, uh, versus your competitors to be able to, uh, to implement on. Right. Finding that X factor. Yep. Well, cool. Um, we got a mic here, so if you guys have a question, say it in the mic so we can get that on the recording um, for our podcast listeners out there. And then, um, yeah. Would you mind swinging them to each other? There you are. Thank you. You bet. Hi, Jack. Thanks for coming. Um, just wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, the, the, the absence uh, around here of uh, fertilization for aviation technology companies. If you go to California, there are 500 companies with uh, in uh, the aviation technology areas of one kind or another, UAV companies, electronics companies, navigation companies, uh, space technology companies. The Air Force has a $200 million uh, venture investment program called AFWorks. There's only one company in Oshkosh that has an investment from AFWorks uh, that is a venture capital backed seed stage company, which is mine. And it's mind boggling to me that the EAA with its spectacular world renowned aviation brand uh, has no sandbox or uh, development center or venture fund or uh, laboratory for uh, aviation technology development. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I, I do, because it, that question comes up a lot, especially when, when they were building the new aviation park. Um, a lot of people don't really understand what EA is. Their, their perception is exactly what, what you say, is we are this, this aviation, part of the aviation industry. We're a membership organization. So we have 250,000 members who we service through our mission and provide what they're asking for, what they paid for. That's our, and that and our event is our revenue stream. We have no technology. We have no engineering capability. We have a, you know, we have a publications department, a marketing department, an events department, and um, our chapter programming. And, and when the business park opened over there, they came here and said, well, can't you bring all of these companies to Oshkosh? And I sat with them for, for many, many meetings saying, okay, let me explain who we are and why we don't, we don't have access to that. We have people that come here and exhibit that do that for a living, but that's not, that's not us. I, and, and what I explained is the city and the county have got to get their head around, and if they should have done this first before they started into this aviation park concept, is to what's, what's necessary to support a business aviation park or attract aviation companies to this area. You have to have a reason for, from a tax standpoint to move here and bring your business here. You have to have a supportive infrastructure for workforce, which means um, the tech or the university needs to be have on-purpose programs that are producing employees that, can, that are skilled in that, those areas and field. You have to have shipping and other things that are necessary to get your product out of here. 
you go through the whole list, and I, what I was sharing with them essentially is what we would go through when we were looking at opening a new facility somewhere, and it's a checklist. And you go out to cities, and they got their pitch deck where they're trying to sell you on being here. And we don't have a pitch deck here that is compelling. And we've got to, I mean, if we want to get serious about that, that's what we got to do. EA would play in that saying, we've got a great environment for your, your kids and, and a reason to be in this area with our museum and what we can do and provide for that. But we, we don't have the, the educational aspect from a career standpoint, unless it's professional flying. Um, I think we become additive to the community in that regard, but it's not going to be the attraction as to why you're here. Sure. And, and we hear it all the time. I mean, it's like, well, Pratt & Whitney, who builds aircraft engines, are definitely going to want to have a facility right next to EA. And I said, CEO Pratt & Whitney are good friends. Is that so we can golf together? I mean, I don't have anything I can do for his company. In my company, I, absolutely nothing. I mean, don't have a, you know, a research and development department or anything like that. No, I, I, and I'm just trying to explain that, that that's a great idea, but my income is derived from members who send me money for a magazine. And I mean, I don't, I don't It sounds it. like a plausible solution could be where the community would get behind an initiative like this. EAA could participate in it in, uh, from a supportive standpoint or from a, you know. If somebody wants to fund it, I'm sure we could find right. a way. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's just the EAA themselves don't have the line items to allocate towards no. research and development. But the but I think to Howard's point that you have the, the visibility of the brand that is so strong um, that it would be a good thing for Oshkosh or the greater community to come up with ideas more or less to your point um, of, of how we could grab you know a part of that area. We know where the resources are and the sure. people and the type. We just don't have them in our walls and don't have funding for it. I mean, Wichita, Kansas, where I'm where I'm from, um, it's the air capital of the world, and it's seven hundred thousand people in the greater area. We have beyond 500 companies that are all aviation. And you look at what happens in that community, it's all focused on attracting those. I mean, between the, the university, the tech school, um, the tax incentive program, it is all set to do nothing but, but attract those companies in there. And you've got an installed workforce that you can poach from, from one to another, but it, it draws those people into that town. Sure. No, that's a great question. I think it's a really interesting topic, and it becomes kind of more of that economic development discussion. I, of, you, you know, know. And is there anybody here from the university? I mean, they started an aviation program a few years ago, and that lasted, what, nine months? Or, I mean, To me, you know, that's a great first step is could we get UWO, and can we then work with them to start this? We're, 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 how do you cultivate developing the people that you need for, that in, for our industry? It is. We have any uh, any other questions or discussion from uh, anyone in the audience? We've got some good good conversation going. We've got Mr. Casper over here. Thanks for joining us, Jack. Uh, question: uh, Every year, I'm just amazed at the number of people that you know, not just come to EA, but the volunteer base that you have. Um, you know, that's a huge feat, as you know, put together, but it's based on uh, true believers and, and passionate people to uh, help come in. I mean, they're coming in four weeks before the uh, air venture. What, what are you guys, what, what are you doing to, to foster that and develop that, that kind of uh, enthusiasm? It, it, you know, to John's point, we can't have the event without our volunteers. There's 5,000 of them that show up to run the event. If you had to pay people to do that, would, it just wouldn't make any sense. Um, it's been generational, so there's been multiple generations that come. One, one of the things we encourage, and this might be a little bit on your entrepreneurial areas, we have chairmen over various areas. You could be parking, you could be, you know, just name it, where they're in charge of. We let them run their area and, and totally empower them and stay the hell out of their way. I mean, we give them what they need to get done with the right resources, whether it be lunch every day, T-shirts, whatever it takes, but they own it. And, and that's been the secret sauce to it is they're believers that come here, they own it. We don't direct, I mean, we try to influence a little bit, 
but let them run the show. Um, our, our biggest concern has been generationally, you know, are we going to run out of airspeed and altitude because they're aging out? And we found out even this last year, we had more volunteers that signed up than what we actually needed. And we're starting to see, um, we, we started a program, uh, call a college volunteer program where we're trying to help foster that next generation by a lot of days. Now they college kids need to do volunteer work of some kind and somehow, and can we get them here, get them involved and make it really fun for them, you know, have evening activities and, and those kind of things that we're, we're looking hard at. How do you expand that? Sure. Yeah. Great question, John. Got anybody else with some questions, uh, for Jack here? Yeah. So earlier you mentioned that if we don't catch that next generation before they get to high school, we've lost them. Um, you know, when we look at the economy where it sits right now, we probably have some underdeveloped assets from hospitality, lodging, those kinds of industries. How do we better get that transfer of talent into that industry? That's a great question. I mean, it, it the the uh, the the pay is certainly there to entice them to come into our industry because it it pay, it's a very lucrative industry as far as paying. Um, it's the training. So how do, how do you find the way to get people retrained for new careers? And you don't see a lot of that going on in a lot of places. Um, I mean, that was something probably something we should focus on is is repatronizing. I think if you patronate, if you will, kind of how do you take somebody and say we can help get you the skills you need to make that transfer. Um, other than that, you, I think you stumped me. That's, that's, <laughs> that's usually I got, yeah, you, usually I, I have an opinion and not necessarily a good answer, but I'm on things. Yeah. I think there is something to um, what you mentioned before, you know, getting the university involved. I've noticed that, uh, you know, we have a great business school, great education school, great nursing school, um, among other things, but the, the kind of technical aspect seems to be an itch that's not being scratched by the community yet, whether that's aerospace, whether it's engineering, whether it's, you know, we've got one of the largest defense contractors in the country working here. So as a community, it's something I've always thought about too. And I think it'll be cool if we can uh, eventually on this show get, you know, a, a UWO representative here to have some of these deeper discussions too on some of the future of the curriculum as well. And, we're, and, and showing them there's a poll, for, a necessary poll that we need. From the community and from the industry, right. The, yep. the other things we fight in the, in the people transferring job, you know, getting out of, I was talking to the guy that's the CFO at Sargento Cheese um, over the weekend and their third shift, which is 10 to 6, to run a machine, they're paying $75,000 a year. They cannot put somebody on the machine for 15 bucks an hour anymore. And so it's like, if that isn't a quick sucking sound to Sheboygan to take some of those kinds of jobs, and, and we're, we're fighting that everywhere. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Anything else uh, from our audience here? We got one in the back here. Uh, having moved back here from New York, I've always wondered, uh, you consider the business environment that I think, I mean, relatively restrained taxes. Why is it that Wisconsin always ranks near the bottom of the table for new business formation? And how can Wisconsin capitalize on what exists here to really power that forward? I, I think there is a piece and a problem with taxes here. I think there's, uh, there's not a lot known in other places about what is the Wisconsin workforce. What, what is, what, how would you, how would you explain it? And what's kind of core to the workforce in Wisconsin, as far as skill sets and types of trades. And um, you, you never hear, you know, you hear for this area, it used to be, be paper and pulp and you hear um, different things, but you don't get the sense. And I think we're, we started to see that with, um, is it Epic down in, uh, Madison, Madison. Yeah. I mean, as far as being a technology play, as far as uh, software industry being and being very successful at it, but we need some, some we need some clusters that we can get around and get known for that. Whether it be healthcare, whether it be um, software, whether it be just raw manufacturing. I, I I know that the manufacturing, aerospace manufacturing in this in this state is the numbers are really high. I mean, as far as the number of shops that are machine shops and things that support the Boeing's and the Airbuses. And you never, you never hear about that. And it's like, we need to promote that that's a cluster that exists here that you can get this work done in the state. I, I mean, I don't know. That's how I feel when I 
when I think about Wisconsin and talk to friends outside of Wisconsin is to, I'm not sure if I've got the elevator speech to sell, you know, what's key, what are the kind of the key as to why, what industry you'd, you'd, why you should look at Wisconsin. Right. I mean, look at, you look at Michigan, you know, Motown, you've got automotive, Mm -hmm. the Rust Belt, that kind of thing. Um, but you're right. I think there the is Detroit, kind of the Detroit re- revitalization around entrepreneurship. I mean, yeah. There's been a lot of stuff like this that's going on there. Yep. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that's a, an interesting problem to, to to solve. You know, if we have ideas out there, bring community members together on a show like this. You know. Um, yeah. We got any other final questions for Jack while while we got him here? While we got him hot on the mic? <laughs> anything good? Anything juicy for us, Jack? Anything you know? Only we know about EAA coming. I, or is this it, new project is you guys are going to really love that. Yeah, I mean, it's when we when we open that up, it's it's going to be special. I'm pretty excited. I, I'm glad you you were able to share some more details on that today. So I really do appreciate it. It's, it's ahead of schedule on on cost. So we can't, hey. we're all happy about that. Yeah, <laughs> that makes everybody happy. And and it completely funded by donors. Six point two million during wow. COVID. They there's some some people that wrote some really big checks. That's great. Yeah. This has been fantastic. Um, if there's no other questions, guys, please w- welcome me and uh, finally giving a fantastic round of applause for Jack Pelton for today's discussion. Thank, thank you. Once again, this was brought to us by the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce. We want to give Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce, John Casper over here, a huge shout out uh, for helping us put this together. You can learn more about the Venture Project at theventureprojectoshkosh.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Grab pizza, please, <laughs> so I don't have to. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Thank you.